Come behind the curtain with private investigator Sheila Waisaki to examine Katie, River, and Aiden's deaths. It was cold and bleak that winter's day in January of 2008, but blonde and bubbly Katie Major was a happy young woman. She knew and really had always known what she wanted out of life, to own a farm where she could raise horses and build a family. Married to Aaron Major, her high school sweetheart, and raising her infant daughter, River Lynn, Katie was well on her way to building the life she had always dreamed of. She was pregnant with her second child and just found out she was carrying a boy. Katie already had a name picked out. Her son would be called Aiden Robert. She called her mother, Vicki, to share the news. The family was close and they talked often. Katie called again that night around dinner time to ask her mom to meet up with her at a local restaurant. Vicki had already picked up takeout and she was already headed home. She told Katie she would have dinner another time. Oh, but that dinner would never come. Just before 2 a.m., Katie's husband Aaron called. Katie, he said, was missing. According to him, Katie had been acting erratically, claiming that she was afraid that someone was coming to kill her. Aaron claimed she took River Lynn just up and left, and after several hours, she hadn't yet returned. What Aaron was saying didn't sound like the Katie that Vicky knew, the Katie who was the oldest of four children, the Katie who loved to help her younger siblings and couldn't wait to be a mother herself. Soft-spoken, Katie was also very artistic. She loved to take walks with her mother and pick flowers, but her biggest love was horses. Vicky remembered the Christmas when Katie was nine and she got her first horse, Poppy. When Katie was nine years old, she got one of her biggest and best Christmas gifts. She had been riding a horse in her lessons and the horse was for sale. And Katie really wanted her, but didn't think she could ever get her to be her own. And we surprised her at Christmas. What we did is we bought a horse, a Briar's horse that looked like Poppy. And she opened that and we had a note in there that Poppy would be her horse. And it was just very exciting. And she owned her for the rest of her life. Poppy actually outlived Katie. And so. So when she went out, can you describe her reaction? Just ran out and hugged Poppy and, you know, it was just ecstatic, excited, cried, definitely cried. You know, she was just so excited and I cried too because it was just a big moment. And Katie, for you know, for the rest of her teenage years, she owned Poppy, but you know, hung out at the barn with Poppy and rode probably five days a week and worked at the farm and everything. Aaron said Katie didn't take her glasses when she left. That didn't make any sense. Vicky didn't believe for one second Katie would drive without them. Not at night, not when the roads were icy, and not with her daughter, River, in the car. She just wouldn't be that irresponsible. She had devoted her life to her daughter, her baby girl. River Lynn was a beautiful, smiley child with wispy, dark blonde hair. Born March 30th, 2007, she was just shy of 10 months old. River was crawling and pulling up so close to taking that first step. Everything would be okay, Vicky thought, because Katie would never let anything happen to River. She would protect her with her own life if necessary. Katie and Aaron had been together for nearly 10 years. They met when she was a senior in high school and he was a freshman. After they started dating, they were inseparable. I started school in ninth grade for um, high school at Northwoods Academy um, off of Trano Road in um, North Charleston. And um, we're going there. Uh, I met Katie just within the first semester of school there via some friends saying that they thought we should go on a date or whatever, and we did. And 
from the first date, we just kind of hit it off. And we were like best friends and pretty much inseparable. Aaron Major was quiet and an avid outdoorsman. He got along well with Katie's parents and spent a lot of time with them over the years. Vicky trusted him and considered him to be like a son. I just don't trust people naturally. To me, trust is earned. And um, it took a few years for me to get comfortable with Aaron and trust him with my daughter. But he spent so much time with us. He pretty much stayed here a lot, you know, with the family. There was issues with his family where he would rather be with our family. You know, he was allowed to sleep on the couch eventually, and he did. He would stay at the couch, stay on the couch, and we had a lake house, and we would go stay there every weekend. And he would come out and hang out and fish, and you know, just be part of the family. So, you know, I learned to trust him. I took him in as a son. It took some time, but I did. I literally took him in as a son. I told Aaron, "I treat you just the same as I treat my other sons," you know, and I trust you and. So it took time, but absolutely by the time they you know they were married, which was five years, they dated for five years. And, you know, I trusted him and I didn't think he'd ever lie to me. I never caught him in a lie. I never thought he would lie to me. That would have been a huge red flag. Um, he was quiet, you know, secretive, somewhat private. The, the word is private. He was a very private person. But, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any concerns that he would lie to me. After Aaron graduated from high school, he went to the community college, but his parents decided that he would attend Clemson University. Aaron was not excited about going to college without Katie by his side, so they decided to get married. His parents weren't pleased with that plan. So college was not easy for Aaron. Katie calls her mom and tells her that she doesn't know Aaron. Suddenly, he's a completely different person. He's depressed and moody, and she didn't know what to do. So they got married in July and immediately moved up to Clemson. So it was the first time Katie had moved away from her family. And she called me right after Christmas, and it may have been about two weeks after Christmas, around the same time of the year in January. And she said, I remember exactly, you know, mom, I don't know who he is anymore. He's depressed. He doesn't want to go to school. You know, he's moody. He's, I don't know who he is. Um, he just wants to lay in the bed and very concerned. She was, you know, bewildered. Like, who is this man I married? I don't know who he is. So we talked and I said, Katie, maybe because his parents made him go to college, which was a known fact. He either went to college or his family would disown him. And I thought maybe he just wasn't handling that well because he was having a hard time deciding what he would want to major in. That was a big deal, you know, because he had went to the local college for two years and then he had to go off to Clemson to get more serious so I said, come home when y'all can, and we'll sit and talk. And I remember when they came home, it been a, it might have been a few months, but I can't remember exactly, but they came home, and I remember sitting, I can look outside my window right now, sitting out in the grass with them. It was spring, it was, you know, but it's never real cold here, but it was warm enough. We were sitting outside, I just kind of sat him down to relax Aaron, to get comfortable with him, you know, trying to get him to open up, like, Aaron, what's going on? And Pretty much in that conversation, it was decided Aaron did not want to go to college. And they felt like that was the problem of his depression. And, and I said, well, let me talk to Katie's dad. Maybe y'all can move home and you can go work for Jeff. And um, that's what ended up happening. I don't even know that he finished that year of school, but they got out as soon as possible and moved back to Charleston. And that was never mentioned again, so I thought that was the problem was solved. He just didn't want to go to college. Aaron lasts only a short time at Clemson, and the newlyweds head back to Monk's Corner. Aaron went to work for Katie's father in his painting business. Aaron and Katie bought a house, and Katie was thrilled to decorate it, to fix meals in her own kitchen, and to work in her yard. 
She planted the flowers she loved to pick as a child. She filled her free time with part-time work at a local Christian bookstore. Like many couples, Katie and Aaron had their issues. We were like best friends, that type of thing. Uh, talked a lot. I mean, we told each other everything, and it was very open and honest and friend, like a friend, you know, type friendship type, you know, intimate friendship relationship. I mean, rarely. I'm not sure we were, I mean, we didn't really like fight. Like I said, it was just more or less, we're both exhausted and you get crabby, you know? Mm -hmm. Nothing. We never argued really about, never any kind of big fight or anything that lasted for more than just whatever, <laughs> until we went to bed or whatever, you know, just sleep or whatever. Aaron was busy working, building up a nest egg. Katie had joined a mommy and me group at their church to meet other mothers and socialize. Once she was pregnant again, it seemed that they couldn't have been happier. If only Katie's world could have remained in that happy bubble. But the nightmare was just beginning. It was January 17th, 2008. Vicky's phone rang at 1.44 a.m., waking her from a sound sleep. It was Aaron telling her he was outside her house and he needed to come in and talk to her. Once inside, he told Vicky and her husband that Katie had been acting strangely, saying that someone wanted to kill her. Not once did Aaron ask if Katie was there with River. Not once did Aaron ask, have you heard from Katie? Aaron brought up things like the Twin Towers and 9-11 conspiracy theories. He said that Katie had probably gone to a hotel to protect herself and his daughter, her child, from whomever was after them. He started telling Vicky about the Antichrist the person that the Bible says will come to gather great power to deceive the world, proclaiming himself to be God. But in the midst of Aaron's verbal vomit, there was one thing he was crystal clear about. He did not want Vicky to call the police. All this stuff that she had been reading was making her paranoid that people were... Like, I mean, she said she thought people were, like, listening to our phone calls and, and monitoring what she had researched on the Internet. And basically, like, someone's kind of, I don't, I don't want to use the word, like, stalking her, but, like, surveillance type. She felt like people were, like, after her or something. And, did did and, she say why? Because um, she felt like she had discovered something that she wasn't supposed to, I guess. In some ways now, life will always be divided into before and after. Mere hours before Aaron appeared in the house, Katie had been happily buying baby clothes and toys in preparation for the day she would bring home her beautiful baby boy. But after Aaron showed up that night, there was nothing but confusion and terror. At Aaron's insistence, he and Vicky got into a truck and drove by local hotels looking for Katie's truck. As Vicky intensely scanned each parking lot and checked every vehicle they passed on the road, she noticed something strange. Aaron wasn't looking at all and he seemed to be favoring one of his hands. At one point, he lifted up, and Vicky noticed it was horribly swollen. She didn't have time to think about it or ask what he had done to it. She had to concentrate on finding Katie and River. Vicky and Aaron eventually split up, taking separate vehicles to be able to cover more ground. It was mid-morning now, and Katie and River hadn't been seen or heard from in over nine hours. 
An hour later, Vicki would get another call from Aaron, telling her to go to Oakley Road that a vehicle had been hit by a train and two people were dead. When she arrived, there was no train and there was no wrecked vehicle. But as she crossed the railroad tracks after deciding to head to the police department, Vicki saw Katie's truck. She immediately called Aaron and told him what she had found. He said he knew. He said he heard on the radio that a woman and small child had been killed. Strangely, he did not ask any questions. Not until he called Vicki back minutes later. Then he asked if she knew what the police were doing. So Aaron called me back and wanted to know what the police are doing. That's what his question was. You know, so what are the police doing? I said, well, I'm waiting here. I was told to wait here and that the police would be coming to talk to me because Aaron is the one that told me they were dead. The police hadn't even told me yet. Did he ever ask, is it Katie or River? No. All I told him is I found Katie's truck and he said, I know, I know, I just heard on the radio that a woman and small child were found dead. He never asked any questions. He didn't say, Vicki, what does your truck look like? Vicki, where are you at exactly? Nothing, you know, nothing of what am I seeing? You know, no, no emotion either because I had to call Katie's dad, Katie's brother, Jeremy, and they're like screaming and hollering and, oh my God, somebody come get me. Katie's dad said, I can't drive. I mean, they are so emotional. And Aaron's just like, um, you know, no questions, you know, it was just night and day. Strangely, he did not ask any questions. Not until he called Vicki back minutes later. Then he asked if she knew what the police were doing. It was a strange question, but everything seemed strange to Vicki right then, and she tried to absorb the awful awful reality that her beloved daughter and granddaughter were dead. The police did want to talk to her, of course, and that's when she met Captain Rick Olick of the Berkeley County Sheriff's Department. The first thing he wanted to know was who sent Vicki to the scene. She explained Aaron, Katie's husband, had. Olick wanted to talk to him as well, so Vicky called him and told him to come back to Monk's Corner. Why to come back? Because he was headed out of town to Columbia. Columbia was where Aaron was going to go to look for Katie. Rick Olick of the Berkeley County Sheriff's Department asked Vicky if she knew of anyone who Katie was afraid of. Yes, answered Vicky. Aaron's mother, Rhonda Major, she gave Rick Olick examples of incidents between the two women over the years that had unnerved Katie. Still in a daze, Vicki was driven home where friends and family were beginning to gather. Captain Rick Olick decided to take Aaron to the station to ask him some questions. Everything still seemed so unreal to Vicki and it was about to get worse. The next day, she said that she got a call from Aaron's mother, Rhonda. The funeral for Katie and River, she said, was going to be a private one. Only Aaron was going to be allowed to attend. As this grieving mother tried to understand why he would want that, why he would want to deny Katie and River's loved ones the chance to mourn together and say their goodbyes. Rhonda dropped another gut punch. She told Vicki not to talk to the police. Rhonda claimed that their pastor had advised them not to tell detectives about Aaron's ramblings, about conspiracy theories, and his strange interpretations of the biblical book of Revelations. They wouldn't want to be labeled as religious fanatics. 
as Vicky struggles to understand why that mattered when Katie and River were dead, why she wouldn't want to tell everything to the police. Rhonda ended the strange call with the words, but Vicky, it's all true. Without warning podcast, season three investigation derailed. Executive director, executive producer, and host, Sheila Waisaki. Mix and Mastery by Junto Media Production. And announcer, Tim Evans. Thank you to Danielle Birch, Chelsea Sarkowskis, and private investigator Jenny Moore for their boots-to-the-ground, passionate, laser-focused research. And a special thank you to Lori Morrison of the podcast, The Unlovely Truth, 